afternoon. I'm Dr. Bonnie Henry, the Provincial Health Officer for British Columbia, and this is our COVID-19 update for today, May 16th. I'm uh, very grateful to be talking to you from the uh, traditional and unceded territories of the Lekongan-speaking peoples of the Esquimalt and the Songhees First Nations. Today we have uh, 21 new cases who have tested positive for COVID-19 in British Columbia, bringing our total to 2,428 people who have tested positive. That includes 878 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 1,184 people in the Fraser Health Region, 126 people here on Vancouver Island Health Region, 181 people in the Interior Health Region, and 59 people in the Northern Health Region. We continue, as people are aware, to have a number of active outbreaks in our health care system, including 15 in long-term care and assisted living centres, and five uh, outbreaks ongoing in acute care units. We have additional cases in, in those areas uh, with now uh, 326 residents or patients being affected and 199 staff people. And this includes, as we uh, mentioned yesterday in our statement, um, an outbreak in the ICU at Abbotsford Regional Hospital that includes six staff people and two patients at this time. There is, of course, a detailed ongoing investigation with Fraser Health uh, along with the, the staff at the unit and the hospital, and uh, that outbreak will be managed by that, uh, by that team. We have no new community outbreaks, but we continue to investigate uh, the most recent one, which was uh, uh, three cases associated with uh, the Oppenheimer fruit and vegetable um, processing plant. And as well, we know there are ongoing outbreaks in a couple of areas in northern Alberta related to industrial camps there. And I am reminding anybody from British Columbia who works in those, those areas where there are outbreaks that when you return home to British Columbia, you are required to self-isolate for 14 days or until you return to your workplace. This is really important as we have seen transmission uh, obviously inadvertently when people don't realize that they are carrying this infection and pass it on to close contacts, including their family members. So we must be continuing to be vigilant. We have 355 active cases now in British Columbia across the province. And of those, 49 people are hospitalized and we have 11 people who are in critical care or ICU. We have one additional death to report today, bringing the total number of people who have died from COVID-19 in British Columbia to 141. And this was a person in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, and our, our condolences and our prayers go to the family members and the care teams and the community who supported this person. We have 1,932 people now who are fully recovered from COVID-19. I want to thank everybody again for, for who has completed uh, the survey, the province-wide Your Story, Our Future survey. And uh, just to make a note that we would like to hear from more seniors, as well as those who live outside our major urban centres, where we've got quite a lot of people who have um, responded. If you have completed the survey, call up an older friend or family member and help them complete it as well. And anybody who works with uh, anybody who's marginalized or vulnerable who may not have access uh, to a computer or to a telephone, please encourage and find ways to assist people, your clients, to take this survey as well. We want to make sure everybody's stories are heard. As we've said, it's available on the BC CDC website or you can uh, take the survey over the phone as well. So as I think many of us are aware, we are uh, cautiously moving towards our phase two, our restart program. We have to move carefully and we have to move thoughtfully. Much of the spread of COVID-19 has occurred um, because in the early stages of symptoms, it's often mild and people may not recognize it or they may not realize that this is what is causing the symptoms that they've had. We've known that there is transmission in BC and in places across Canada and around the world where people have come together. 
And these are the important situations where we know um, transmission has happened, whether it's been in a choir practice, whether it's been an event like a birthday party or a funeral, where one person who may be uh, in the early stages or have quite mild symptoms can transmit this virus to others who they've been in close contact with. We know that the risk is greatest when you're in a group and when you're indoors, when the ventilation is not as great, when you can actually spend time uh, very close to people in an enclosed space. This means we must continue to stay alert and stay vigilant. And this May long weekend, we need to pause. We need to stay close to home and think through how all of us in BC will put into place our new safe social interaction rules uh, for the coming days and weeks. The rules that will help us protect our families, our communities, our businesses and our province. So starting on Tuesday, May 19th, businesses can start be to begin the process of safely reopening. Uh, for those who are following this, there are a number of orders that we had put in place over the, the past couple of months and I have revised those orders and they're now posted on, uh, on the, the gov.bc.ca website. And these uh, were posted last evening, but the orders will not come into effect until Tuesday. Tuesday uh, the 19th is when we can start this process. As well, WorkSafe BC and public health um, experts have developed guidance that is now available for several of the important industry sectors that we'll be looking at um, starting to reopen starting on Tuesday. The guidance balances our need to be practical and sensible and safe when developing our plans to reopen. And I just must say that an incredible amount of work has been put into finding the best path forward. We've been looking at what people have been doing around the world and how it has worked and what are the important measures that seem to make a difference in protecting people even as we increase our, our connections and our economy. And I just want to put a big thank you out to the many um, public health uh, physicians, our, our environmental health officers, our experts, and the workplace health experts from WorkSafe BC who put a, a lot of time and effort in mobilizing so quickly over, particularly over the past week as things became more and more apparent. Um, that's an important job that you have done and will continue to do in the weeks ahead and I thank you for that. And so that everybody knows WorkSafe BC and public health inspectors in your local area will be available for you to consult with in the coming weeks. Some of the same rules for social interactions apply to our businesses as well. We need to continue to remember to think about smaller groups, having pods of, group, of workers who work together consistently, fewer faces, less time together, bigger spaces. No matter what your business is or where you may be operating, it's very important to remember the most effective ways to reduce the potential for transmission of COVID-19. And those are making sure we have safe physical distancing, never allowing anyone with symptoms to come into your place of work. And this applies to you, your employees and customers. So you need to have the appropriate processes in place to identify anybody who's feeling unwell and ensure that they have the ability to remain away from work or school. There can be no flexibility on this piece. This is the most important thing that we as a community need to do to make sure that we can get ourselves um, going again, that we can start having those social connections. We have to make a pact with each other that we are going to keep our germs to ourselves and stay away from others if we're feeling unwell. For businesses where you can't always keep that physical distance, there are barriers that are incredibly effective. So we know we call them engineering controls, putting up that plexiglass barrier between me and a person that I need to get in uh, closer contact with can protect me from them and them from me. Those are effective things. Uh, administrative controls that, that reduce the numbers of people in a place, a space at one time, um, that maintain distances between people. So things like having one-way streets or one-way aisles in a grocery store, for example. And clear policies for customers and employees to follow are some of the important additional measures. 
I do want to say a, a, a little bit about masks. So we do know that non-medical masks can be helpful for those very short periods of time where we may not be able to maintain our physical distance. But they do not replace the important engineering controls, distance measures, and administrative controls. They are something we can do in addition for those short periods of time where we may come in contact with somebody. And medical masks, non-medical masks are not considered personal protective equipment. They are things that we do to keep our droplets in and in that way they protect others in some ways. So if we have to have, and I'm thinking of hairdressers, which I'm very excited, will certainly, hopefully be coming online soon. You know, when we're in that period of time where we, we try and reduce the amount of time that we spend close to each other, but my wearing a mask and somebody else wearing a non-medical mask keeps our droplets to ourselves. And those are the situations that we should be using these. When we're thinking about going on transit, we want to maintain and we will be maintaining physical distances on transit, but there may be times when you cannot be um, that safe space away from people for short periods of time and a non-medical mask can if all of us are doing it can protect each other it is however the least effective of all of those measures in place so it does not replace our focus on making sure that we are staying away if we are ill and maintaining our safe distance from each other so business owners, I know you will have many questions as you adapt your business and develop your COVID-19 safety plans. One of the things that we are requiring is that you do have a COVID-19 safety plan and that it's available for inspectors from either Public Health or from WorkSafe BC. And it's also available for your employees and for your customers so that you know and everybody knows what we are doing to keep ourselves safe in your environment. And we're here to support you on that. Your first number to call, the WorkSafe BC Prevention Information Line at 1-888-621-7233 is your first step. So that's a place to go to get the detailed information about your business and your circumstance and WorkSafe BC can help you work through those issues. Each health authority around BC also has environmental health officers who can guide you along the way, particularly for those areas where EHOs are, are involved in licensing and inspecting um, on a regular basis. And, and many, I know, uh, businesses know who they are, but restaurants, for example, daycares, for example, and many other places, our environmental health officers uh, play an integral role in supporting you and keeping your business safe, and they will continue to do that through COVID-19. As we cautiously progress through our restart plan and know that we are in this together, and I mentioned this the other day, COVID-19 is new for all of us, not just here in BC, but around the world. And I'm reminded of the, the Blue Rodeo song, <laughs> you know, if we're, if we're lost, then we're lost together. And we'll make it through this together by being kind and being patient and we may not be 100% right, right off the bat, but we'll work things out. And we'll work out the, the guidance to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to keep us all safe and make sure that we're not giving this virus a chance to take off again. So step by step, let's continue to work with each other with kindness and with compassion and continue to, to be kind and be calm and be safe. And thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. As a reminder to everybody on the phone, please press star one to enter the queue. You are limited to one question. Please also unmute your phones. You will not be audible until I call your name. First question is from Bethlehem Miriam, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks so much for taking my question. Um, you touched on this, but I would love to hear more thoughts on how um, some businesses, particularly restaurants, are saying that you know, following the six guidelines may actually uh, hurt them more financially because they may not be able to serve the number of customers they actually need to and the extra expenses associated with uh, PPE and plexiglass. Uh, just looking to hear some thoughts about that. 
Yes, I know, and this is a, an incredibly challenging time. But we know that uh, that managing this virus is the best thing that we can do to manage our economy, and it is not going to be possible for every business to open and to open in a way that's safe for everybody. So we know that uh, we need to restrict the number of people who come together in enclosed spaces right now. And for some restaurants, that just won't be physically possible given their layout. For many, they will be able to have a, a, a mixture of takeout, which many have been doing for, for quite, quite effectively, and in um, place dining. We are looking at you know, expanding uh, capacity for people to have outside tables. And for this first phase, uh, you know, the second phase, but the first part of our restart, we have put in guidance that is quite restrictive because we are not yet at the place where it is safe to have many people gathering in an indoor environment sharing food. It's not safe for the people who are in there uh, who are coming together in groups, but also we need to make sure it's safe for the, the employees, so our serving staff, the kitchen staff. And so we have intentionally minimized uh, the number of people that can be in an indoor environment. And I realize that that is going to be a challenging thing for many restaurant owners. Um, we know that's going to be a challenging thing, the guidance that we need to have in place for uh, personal service establishments like hairdressers or barbers or nail salons, um, even retail spaces. We know that uh, grocery stores have done a great job, but it has been challenging for many, especially smaller stores, to manage the numbers of people that can uh, be through. Um, and it is, it is unfortunate, and that's why we have government programs to support businesses. But in terms of safety, these are the measures that we need to have now to make sure that we're not giving this virus a chance to explode again. Next question is from Lisa, oh, sorry, Joel Ballard, CBC. Hello, Dr. Henry. Um, we're hearing some concerns from dentists who recently received their new guidelines from the College of Dental Surgeons. Uh, the updated document says they're only required to wear an N95 mask when treating a patient with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. This is a change from the previous document which said it should be worn at all times during a shift especially because dentists are so susceptible because of the nature of their work. Um, what advice has public health provided the College of Dental Surgeons um, for their new guidelines? And, and are these guidelines in line with that advice that you've given them? Yes, it, it, it is. And uh, there, there has been um, a lot of work done by infection prevention and control experts from dental as well as uh, medical services around the, the country and around the world. And we have always said for most procedures, um, even with somebody with known COVID-19, you can safely provide care wearing a, a level four surgical mask um, and face protection, face and eye protection, so either goggles or uh, face shields. And this is a really important thing. We're talking now about um, dentists gradually, slowly reopening their practice to in uh, to community practice space other than emergency services. And so the really key thing for, for them as well as for other uh, community-based care providers, physicians, um, physiotherapists, others, is to, um, the very first important thing is to screen out people who may have uh, this disease. That's what keeps us safe. So that is the focus of this, and, and there's a, a lot of detailed guidance around um, how we can do that safely in community-based practices. And as somebody who's been in family practice was for many years, I know that these are challenging. But it, the first thing that we need to do is make sure that we are excluding anybody who has symptoms that could be related to COVID-19 from our practice in dentistry. So that's the focus, and there is a, a lot of detailed guidance in there, but that is absolutely the way um, that our infection control experts from around the, the country and internationally are, are providing guidance around that. Next question is from Lisa Cordasco, CHLY. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Henry. Um, I'm just wondering if 
Are there um, sort of random inspections by environmental health officers going on in processing plants, you know, like Oppenheimer? And if so, how many have been conducted and, and what are your findings? Are, are they finding that workers are far enough apart, that uh, they're wearing surgical masks if necessary, and that there's good, you know, health screening checks going on? Yeah, so we have um, both random and systematically been looking at uh, those types of situations since we had uh, the poultry outbreaks and and uh, the large outbreak that we saw uh, outbreaks that we've seen in other places, particularly in Alberta. So yes, um, there is inspections going on. Uh, it's a combination. So we know that there's some federally inspected plants where the food safety aspects are, are under uh, federal guidance and the health uh, worker aspects are either under WorkSafe BC or in some cases under our environmental health programs in, in our health authorities. So yes, we do combined um, inspections and we have been targeting uh, those places. And I will say that uh, this most recent outbreak was caught very early because people are paying attention to the guidance. And uh, my understanding is that there are appropriate physical measures, for example, in place in that uh, facility and that um, the investigation and in it's why the facility has not been shut down because there are appropriate things in place. So uh, we did make a concerted effort to address uh, all of the uh, essential plants that were working. Um, I don't have the exact number of how many have been uh, physically inspected, but I know there was a blitz done um, around the province to make sure that we had at least uh, reviewed plans and had made contact with each of them. Keith Baldry, Global News. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, again, more um, emails and, and contacts with teachers concerned about the personal measures outlined in the document uh, governing the return to school about staying home when sick and a reference that students may still receive in-person instruction if another person in their home uh, has symptoms of COVID-19 as long as they re remain asymptomatic. I'm just wondering what you can tell them to sort of calm their fears on that. Yeah, so this is, of course, we know that every case is investigated. There are many reasons why people might have a, a respiratory illness in the home. And unless they have been told that, that they are a contact of COVID-19 from public health, there is no reason to keep healthy children out of school um, if there's somebody in their household who has some other illness. So it's mainly uh, to, to um, reassure people that that's an appropriate way to proceed. Again, we need to be very cautious, especially in June, um, and then uh, make sure that we um, have the processes in place to really assess people every day. And that's you know, the, the part that we in public health will be paying a lot of attention to, making sure that we have very little uh, that, that that there is no risk of somebody coming into uh, a classroom who has illness, that we have no tolerance for that and the ability to be able to support people in screening um, uh, for symptoms um, before they leave the house, when they get to the school, etc. Next question is from Melissa Thibault, CTV. Oh, hi, Dr. Henry. Uh, I want to ask about the new outbreak that's been detected at Abbotsford Hospital and uh, if you have a response to concerns raised by the Nurses Union um, regarding healthcare workers getting access to PPE. Sure, and I have uh, had a detailed report about what is happening at uh, that outbreak, and it. Uh, I have been reassured by my colleagues who work in, in that facility and all of the ICUs, and this has been something we have um, put a focus on. There has been no shortage of PPE. There is no uh, concerns with with the workers in those, the healthcare workers in those facilities of being able to access what they need to be able to safely care for uh, people with. COVID-19 in the ICU. So that's not an issue that has been uh, associated with this outbreak. And it is one of the important things that we have been doing around our measures to, to try and preserve our PPE to ensure that those highest risk settings like the ICUs that are caring for people with this virus have what they need. And, and I really want to say, you know, this reminds us, this outbreak reminds us of how pernicious 
pernicious this virus is and how difficult it is to manage it because we know that, that people can have very mild illness and may not recognize it in themselves. And that can lead to, to, to opportunities for it to be transmitted widely. And all of the measures that we have done as a community across BC to ensure that we don't overwhelm our hospitals has been um, allowed us to keep our healthcare workers safe. And we know that um, you know, it's a challenging thing to do, particularly with very ill people in the ICU. Um, and the PPE is, is when we take it, put it on and take it off, we can, um, we can contaminate ourselves. And so those are the things that has made a huge difference. One, people are getting the care they need and are surviving and doing well. And two, we're not overwhelming our system so that healthcare workers are not able to take that careful measured approach to ensuring that they're protecting themselves with each and every encounter. And it may sound a bit melodramatic, I guess, but you know this, this reminds us that it is a very challenging virus to deal with, particularly when people are very sick. Next question is from Jeff Andreas, Radio NL. Um, once phase two of the restart plan begins on Tuesday, you know, you've said it will take up to 28 days before we know if we can really move on to phase three. Uh, I was just wondering how many days do you think it could take before you see that perhaps we opened up too soon and look to draw back some of the reopening and sort of what are the potential signals that you will look to to say that, you know, we need to go back to phase one? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm hopeful that our approach is going to not take us there. But yeah, absolutely. We're, the things we're looking at, of course, are numbers of cases that we're seeing in the community, numbers of new cases, particularly numbers of new cases that aren't easily linked to a chain of transmission that we know about. So right now we know that there's been a couple of cases at uh, a, a number of industrial uh, plants. And if we find a new case and we can link it back to that, we say, okay, you know, that, that was still a person who was in that incubation period. Um, when we have new cases that arise in the community that we don't have a link for, those are concerning, more concerning. So we'll be looking, and as we know, the incubation period is up to 14 days, but for most people, it's somewhere between day five to day seven. So that's why we've given ourselves a little bit of leeway. So we'll be watching over the next uh, week to two weeks, and then depending on what happens, we may need to extend that period depending on how many new cases we have. The other things that, that are incredibly important are ensuring that we have the capacity to test everybody that we need to test. So if we have a new uh, cluster identified, we can do rapid testing of everybody that needs it, whether that's 10 people or 100 people that are in contact with that person. Um, and we have, I'm confident we have that capacity right now, but we'll be watching that very carefully to be able to do that quickly. And that we have the capacity to follow up on every single positive case within 24 to 48 hours. So that's the public health work, the case management and the contact tracing and making sure that we can get to all of the contacts uh, within a very short period of time. So those are some of the basic measures. We'll also be watching, of course, the number of people in hospital because that's an indicator to us of um, of I increased transmission in the community and our ICU uh, capacity, especially as we start to increase our, our surgeries that um, takes over hospital beds and ICU beds because out of necessity, uh, some of them need to, uh, will uh, require ICU care. So we need to find that uh, balance and be able to have the surge capacity should we need it. So I'm confident, though, that with the measures we have in place, and they may seem overly restrictive to many people, um, and that is intentional. That is intentional because we want to start, start slowly and methodically and thoughtfully and watch carefully. And that's what we will be doing over the coming weeks. Bob Mackin, Breaker News. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, the BC wide number for testing this week has averaged around so 1,700 samples a day, and that's far below the capacity, which we've been told is more than 6,000 per day. Uh, despite opening testing to anybody with symptoms, I know that priority is given to urgent sampling only that because of uh, limited reagent supply and limited stockpile of viral swabs. Um, how and when will the BC CDC solve this uh, supply issue 
so a testing can be conducted at full capacity. Yeah, so we do not at the moment have uh, concerns with supply of reagent or uh, swabs. We do, uh, we're part of the national uh, program for procuring of both of those, although we do have some in-house uh, reagents being done here in BC as well. So that is not a limiting factor right now in our testing. We are testing anybody who has symptoms in BC, as well as we have a number of surveillance tests that we do on an ongoing basis that we continue to do. Um, we've talked about that before. Um, and in addition, we have the ability to do, with rapid turnaround, to do testing of any clusters, contacts of cases. And, and that's what we've been seeing. The, the bottom line is we are not going to just randomly test for no purpose. That is wasteful and, in my mind, wastes um, both reagents and, and swabs. And yes, you know, we do need to be sensitive uh, to uh, the fact that uh, around the world, there's a challenge with getting the appropriate swabs, um, but there is some uh, really great initiatives happening across Canada to develop and, and actually print and produce uh, swabs here in Canada, and that's moving ahead very, uh, very quickly. So, having said that, so I, I'm I'm comfortable with the capacity we have and the fact that we aren't testing 7,000 people a day is because there are not that many people in the community right now who need to have a test. And that's a reflection of the fact that we have lower rates of respiratory illness right now and that we are managing and catching uh, these outbreaks early so that there's not lots of people who might have potentially been exposed. And uh, our plans, and I've talked about this a number of times, but as we go into the, the fall, our plans over the summer are to ramp up our capacity for testing, to make sure we have an ongoing um, access to reagents, to swabs, to everything that we need, and a strategy so that people can effectively and efficiently get tested um, if needed as we go into the fall. Because we know as respiratory season starts, whether COVID will increase again, we still don't know, but it is a probability. Um, but we know we're going to start seeing influenza and RSV and all of the other things that cause respiratory illness and that we'll need to ramp up our testing to make sure we can rule out COVID and we can detect influenza because there's important measures we need to take to pr protect people from influenza as well. Next question is from Mary Brook, West Shore Voice. Hello, Dr. Henry. Um, with more children heading back to school in BC on June 1st, and or starting June 1st, um, I'm just wondering if you have a comment for parents about the COVID-19 infection in children. The World Health Organization is reporting clusters of children and teens requiring hospitalization with a multi-system inflammatory condition similar to Kawasaki and toxic shock. Um, so have any of these symptoms been seen in youngsters in BC? And will you be strengthening your public health messaging that COVID affects all age groups, perhaps just in different ways? And also, do you have a tally for the survey? Oh, Coming. you know what? I tried to get the tally for the survey before we came down and, and we couldn't get it today. So I, I, I apologize for that. Well, we will have it um, on Monday. Um, people are taking some time off this weekend, so I think that's a good thing. Yeah, in terms of, of children, um, this is the Kawasaki-like syndrome that we've started to see arise. And, and as you say, it has been renamed Multisystem Inflammatory Disease in Children, or MISC. Um, because it is, it's a very similar type of reaction as what we've seen with Kawasaki disease, which is something that has been around for a long time. It is a, a, a post-infectious inflammation that we know has been triggered um, by other viruses and other um, bacterial infections as well in children, generally younger children. So that's one of the things that's slightly different. Um, we're seeing it in children who are school aged, whereas Kawasaki disease more often affected children who were um, five and under. It causes an inflammation of, of the blood vessels in many children, um, and that's one of the most concerning things because it can lead to uh, a rash um, from some of the smaller blood vessels, but it can also lead to inflammation of the blood vessels around the heart, and that can be uh, very serious infections. We know of about 110 or so cases in, in New York, including three deaths in, in young people, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, and an 18-year-old, as I recall as well as uh, about 19 states in the U.S. 
So here in BC, uh, we've had uh, 69 uh, cases of COVID-19 in children uh, or young people who are under the age of 19 and I think there was 24 um, under the age of 10 and 45 uh, young people between the ages of 10 and 19. We have had two hospitalizations of children under the age of 10 and one person between the age of 10 and 19 who's been hospitalized in BC. We have had no ICU and no deaths in children in BC and there's, as far as I know, uh, as of yesterday, there were no COVID positive uh, children who had this syndrome. We do see Kawasaki syndrome all the time. It is something that is very rare, but it is seen on an ongoing basis. So there is likely to have been some children with Kawasaki syndrome here in BC over the ca past couple of weeks. Um, we've had a, a an alert out to, to pediatricians and to uh, um, infectious disease specialists, pediatric ID specialists to, to watch for this. And we have not seen it in, in anybody COVID positive. There have been some cases I'm aware of in Montreal that may be linked. So the challenge that we have is this is a, a relatively rare syndrome still. We know there's been some uh, reports from the UK as well. Um, but not all of the uh, children who have this multi-system inflammatory disease test positive for COVID-19. A good proportion of them did, and it is likely that it could be associated with, with this infection because we have seen it with other viral infections. It's one of those things that comes after. So it, it, it can be after the child has recovered from the infection or appears to have recovered, and then it's part of their body's response to, to uh, the, the inflammation caused by the virus or the other infection, it, it leads to this syndrome. So we still don't know a whole lot about it. Uh, we are, of course, watching carefully. The other things that I think are also really important is this syndrome is associated perhaps with children who do have COVID-19. What we also know is that children are much less likely to get infected with it, and they're much less likely to have severe illness. Um, and the, the, the rates of infection in children around the world still are very, uh, very low. So for us, it's, it's less than 2% of all of the cases. And that is about the same as we're seeing in many other countries. So it's, this disease still has less impact on children, which is good for all of us. I mean, the, the one thing that we want are our precious commodities for the future are to be able to protect our children. We also know that it's much more likely that children will get infected from an adult than an adult will get infected from a child. And we know that from a number of the family studies, uh, some of the clusters that we've seen around the world. We will, of course, be continuing to watch this. And one of the important things that we need to have in every school, in every daycare, is a plan for if a child becomes ill while in that facility. And we in public health will be watching that very carefully. We'll be making sure that there's a, a, an appropriate plan to support isolation of the child, that they can be taken home immediately, they can be assessed and tested as needed, and we can support the entire community, school community, um, if that happens. So that's part of our planning for, for June. So we have time for one more question today. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question, there will be a statement released later this afternoon. For recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the provincial Provincial Health Officers Orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Ben Litka, Abbotsford News. No, Ben? Okay, that's all the time we have today. Thank you.